This Good Friday meditation looks at 12 stations of the cross using reflections and paintings written and produced by the artist Jen Norton and published in her book Surrender All. For each section there will be a brief introduction to the title of the painting followed by a reflection followed by one minute of silence before we move on to the next station. Please use this time for your own reflection and prayer. Jesus is condemned to death. Evil exists and it's part of our human condition. Even with the best of intentions, our spines bend under the weight of fear, jealousy, shame and pride. After the last Passover meal, Jesus shares with his closest companions, the story turns dark as the power of evil encroaches. Jesus is betrayed by a close friend, condemned by leaders of his own faith and sentenced to death by a political opportunist. Giving in to mob mentality, the same crowd whose resounding hosannas carried him into Jerusalem now publicly mock and condemn him. Jesus is utterly shunned and alone, heartbreakingly, soul-crushingly deserted. Look at the painting and see the splashes of red which denote points of pain. In this station, Jesus is bound and powerless. The Lamb of God doesn't defend himself. He no longer heals, converts or touches. The heavy, dark cross walls off Jesus from the crowd, just as God's presence in blue seems to withdraw from him. Note the flashes of red among the crowd as well. Some in that crowd knew he was innocent. Some were uncertain and didn't speak out. Many bystanders felt powerless against evil and condemned by their own fears. In condemning Jesus, in abandoning him to a cruel death, they also condemn themselves. And so do we. It's so easy to believe that in similar circumstances we'd never condemn Jesus ourselves. But Jesus isn't just the one we find in the pages of Scripture. The real Jesus lives in us and among us. He's in the homeless, the immigrant and the disabled. He is in the man who honours his wife, the woman who cares for her neighbour, the child who doesn't steal even when no one is looking. He is in the chaos of possibility and the order of discipline. We all know the outcome of this story. It's so easy to want to jump ahead, to forget what this awful night was like. But to get to redemption we must first confront and name the stone in our own hearts. We must take our place in this scene.
Jesus takes up his cross. A cross is not an easy thing to carry. It's easy to forget in modern life where we wear crosses as jewellery and hang them on our walls for decoration. But look at any crucifix and you will be reminded of the rugged horror it presented in its heyday as a Roman torture device. It had to hold the weight of a man, so it must have been thick and heavy. You can bet nobody sanded it down, so it must have dug splinters into the victim's shoulders and hands. And it most certainly didn't have handles or wheels for easier transport. A person sentenced to crucifixion had to carry the ultimate weapon of his demise uphill for about half a mile, in full view of a mob of town voyeurs. There was no relief, only shame, exhaustion and ultimate death. The obvious pain and suffering were meant to deter anyone else from going against the rule of law. One would have to be crazy to risk the same. But Jesus wasn't just anyone. He was the Son of God. And he had a mission to shoulder the weight of the world. He was and is a true king. Unlike most political rulers throughout history, he didn't demand that his subjects bow to his will. Rather, he bowed to God's will, surrendering everything for the sake of his subjects. He was revolutionary, countercultural. He was zealous, confrontational, and he was willing to accept the consequence of the cross to show us he was also compassionate and obedient. As he picks up his cross, his shoulders ache and his hands sting. God's divine love, shown again in the blue of the halo, encircles him and grows radiant as he takes hold. Jesus called his disciples to take up their cross and follow him. A reminder of the fact that to follow Jesus we need to be willing to put ourselves to death. Our selfish human desires. To put our lives on the line to surrender them to God through Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus here surrenders his own life to the will of the Father. Jesus falls for the first time. It's no accident that Jesus falls early in the stations. He had been up all night praying before being interrogated by the Sanhedrin and Pilate. After his conviction he was beaten, mocked with a crown of thorns, and then forced forward, bearing the heavy burden 
of the rugged cross. His will, the will of his father, was strong, but his flesh was weakening. He was tired. The forces of evil and gravity were pulling him down. If Jesus had been relying solely on human strength, that stumble and fall might have been the end. But his will was always aligned with the Father's, and the Spirit gave him strength to hold fast to his Father's redemptive plan. Not so with us. Our will is so easily enticed along the wrong path, even with the best of intentions. Like children clamouring for the largest slice of cake at a birthday party, we can commit a thousand selfish acts every day without even realising it. We love to pass the buck and simultaneously justify our actions, especially if no one else is looking. Time after time, we put our own desires above what is good for others, all the while acting holier than thou. Satan loves this, of course. We make it so easy on him, but we should be on watch for those small missteps. Each one pulls us away from our destination of holiness. If we are not open to correction, we can find ourselves on a path of relativism, deaf to that still small voice of the Spirit. This makes it much easier for the devil to lead some people blindly into pits of self-pity, despair and self-righteous pride, and to tempt others with bigger sins, causing injuries to the soul that are far more serious than knee scrapes. No, we must stay aware and disciplined in our ordinary steps if we are continued to walk. No, we must stay aware and disciplined in our ordinary steps if we are to continue to walk with Jesus. Jesus meets his mother. From the day her child is born, a mother begins to let go. First steps, first day at school, first heartache, first child of their own. A mother's selfless love lays the foundation for the life her child will lead. And like Mary, Mothers ponder. They see the connections between actions and emotions. They recognise the purpose of their children's lives drawn out over time. Attentive mothers will teach their children how to have compassion for themselves and others. Yes, Jesus was God, but he was also fully human. Like every child, he was born innocent and helpless. As he grew, he needed proper direction from his parents in order to become all that he was meant to be. And now, on the road to Calvary, Mary experienced every mother's worst nightmare. 
her precious child, at the mercy of destructive forces, in terrible pain, and about to die a slow and shameful death. No amount of pondering could have prepared a mother for that heart-piercing experience. Jesus sees his mother in the crowd and pauses. As their eyes meet, does he attempt to comfort her? Or does he crumble into her arms in tears? Is she strong, encouraging him with her presence and love? Or is she beside herself with heart-wrenching grief? Do each of them move on, step by painful step, reminding themselves that somehow all will be well, that God has not forsaken them? Each of these responses is possible. Here we see the cross closing in on them, its oppressive heaviness suffocating them both. For the last moments of their fully human lives, mother and son are connected in a holy and momentary embrace. No words are recorded. Perhaps no words were necessary. Jesus falls the second time. One can imagine the scene. A half-naked woman, dragged from the very bed in which her affair had been discovered, is standing in the middle of a circle of angry men. And where is the one she was with? Did he run off? We don't know. The story centres around the most helpless person, the scapegoat, with virtually no voice, the woman. And where is Jesus? He appears among the men and is handed the power to convict. The wolves have circled, hungry for blood and justification. They are ready to fall upon the prey. Jesus doesn't say not to stone her or even that stoning her is wrong, or that their wrath is unjustified. He upholds the law. He merely specifies who should throw the first stone, the one without sin. As he silently writes in the sand, we're told that each man goes away, one by one, beginning with the elders. They didn't leave in a group, or with a companion, but alone. Interesting. We don't know exactly what Jesus was writing when this incident took place. It could have been the Mosaic law. The scribes and Pharisees would have been well versed in it and recognised their own sins as they saw them written down. Or maybe he was writing specific indiscretions, perhaps as each one recognised his own fallen state written by the only one with true authority to convict, they chose to leave silently, not wishing to discuss their faults with their peers. And why the elders first? 
they have the hindsight of age. It's easier to justify wrong when you haven't lived long enough to see the consequences of your actions. It's a much more brutal conviction when you've had years to reflect and realise you're much closer to your own Day of Atonement. Now the woman faces only Jesus, the man without sin. She has broken the law and expects a consequence. He is within his right to throw a stone. However, he hasn't come here to convict, but to offer salvation. He knows we all fall, unable to stand against the power of our own human desires. Maybe we even need to fall in order to view life from a different vantage point. Jesus meets the woman in the middle of her mess and shame and offers her liberation. He sees her whole story, not just one fallen moment. He only asks that she use this gift wisely and not sin again. She doesn't know it, but he will take the fall for her against that angry circle of men. That's what true love does. Jesus meets Simon of Cyrene. Jesus was physically broken. He was unable to carry his cross any further. So the Roman guards looked around and grabbed the first strong guy they found to help, Simon of Cyrene. Simon was a long way from home. Cyrene, Libya, is more than a thousand miles from Jerusalem. Perhaps he was there for work, or maybe he was part of the Jewish population from Libya that came up for the Passover festival. Either way, he couldn't have known when he woke up that morning that he'd end up as a significant player in the spectacle of an execution or that 2,000 years later, people around the globe would remember his name. What was he thinking as the Roman soldiers approached? Did he look around at all the people swarming past him and wonder, why me? Or did he recognise God's voice in the call of these soldiers and step forward willingly to do the work? True, he probably didn't feel like it, but on this day, love was shown through action. Look at the colours in the image. As Simon carries the cross with Jesus, notice how the red of pain is transferred to his part of the cross. It was a thankless task that put him at the mercy of the soldiers along with Jesus. But also notice how the negative space between their bodies becomes the shape of a heart, and the line of the cross is much thinner and lighter within that act of love. Simon now bears the divine blue halo for his willingness to bear Jesus' burden. Simon probably did not feel the enormity of the passion story he was entering. 
He may not have been fully aware of who Jesus was in this encounter. But on this day, Jesus was a stranger in need. And Simon didn't turn away. Simon's simple yes brought him close to Jesus and subsequently influenced his sons, Alexander and Rufus, who were later known to the Christian communities. Thus, his work of mercy rippled out across time and space, reaching even us today. God is big enough to find each of us right where we are. We cannot hide from his love, yet he is also the gentle father who calls to us through the longing of our hearts. We always have the choice to listen and follow or to turn and run elsewhere. At times we are called to help. At other times we are called to accept help gratefully. Either way, when we put aside our fears and hesitations, we are given the chance to understand the deep love of Jesus. Jesus falls the third time. As we prayerfully follow Jesus' way to Calvary, we are given three chances to examine the nature of a fall. The way of the cross is an unbearably difficult one for us humans. Our very essence embodies the disability of frailty. No matter how willing the spirit our flesh can and will fail us. Perhaps we act out, mindlessly numbing pains and resentments, or we are compulsively drawn to a destructive activity in an attempt to fill an emptiness in our soul. We earthen vessels can get horribly cracked and broken. If you have gone through something really big, really life-altering, you may have reached that point where there was nothing left but prayer. That's not a bad thing. Prayer is the resin that can fill those soul ruptures and make us whole again. When we fall to our knees, crushed by sin or depleted of strength, our only view is up. It is only after burning every bridge and exhausting every idea that we reach rock bottom and can gaze up at the cross wholeheartedly, humbly and meekly crying, help me, Jesus. Falling may be a necessary part of our life. When we become aware of our own shortcomings and finally submit to God's will, we are gifted with grace. The help we so desire. Not only are we forgiven, but we find God's grace to be sufficient for us to soldier on. Our fragile souls expand and are fortified as we see that Jesus has been there all along, waiting in the surrender. In that moment, the devil is defeated and hope conquers 
despair. Jesus is stripped of his garments. In this final act of shaming, Jesus is stripped of his only earthly possessions and ceases to hold any social classification other than that of the cast-out scapegoat. He is mocked and exposed in the most demeaning way possible, robbed of any definition of self. To his persecutors and to the mocking crowds that surround him, he is nothing. But wait, let's take a look at what they did with his stolen clothing. As they brutally tortured and murdered this man, the soldiers seemed to take great care with his belongings. The clothes must have been bloody and dirty from the arduous journey up the hill, yet they don't discard them. Unknowingly fulfilling scripture, the soldiers carefully divide them among themselves and decide to keep one seamless undergarment intact. Clothing, both then and now, determines a person's social status. Jesus' clothing conveys something of his nature to the world. Scripture says his tunic was woven in one piece from the top down. This is significant because everyday Palestinian tunics most commonly would have been made of two pieces sewn together. The garment that Jesus wore would have required skill to make and was probably specially made for him. Also significant is the seamless garment's connection with the priesthood of the Old Covenant. The Greek word hippodites is used for the seamless woment garment worn under Jesus' clothing, which correlates with the inner garment or tunic worn under a Levitical priest's ephod or outer robe, something Aaron was to wear as he entered the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. We see the significance of this after Jesus dies when the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. Like his tunic, the veil would have been seamless. Its rending signifies a divine action from heaven to earth, God to man. The meticulous observations and sacrificial offerings of the ancient covenant are no longer needed. A new, unbreakable covenant signified by the untorn garment of Christ, is now established. Jesus, the true High Priest, has atoned for our sins once and for all.
Jesus is nailed to the cross. Jesus was nailed to the cross less than 24 hours after Jesus was nailed to the cross less than 24 hours after he shared the last supper with his disciples in the upper room. He had gathered with his closest friends, welcoming them and saying to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. One can imagine him embracing each apostle with a heartfelt bear hug as he entered. It speaks to his great love that even in knowing he would soon be betrayed by a friend and be put to death by the leaders of his own faith, he is still able to focus on the celebration at hand. Later he will be praying in agony on the Mount of Olives, but for now he chooses to be fully present with his friends, sharing the traditional meal and confiding his final words of love and wisdom to them. Eleven of them listened intently, hearts full as their rabbi spoke. One person did not. Judas had already conspired to hand Jesus over to the Jewish leaders and was preoccupied with his own task. Did he resent Jesus' popularity? Was he swayed by empty rationales or money? Did he want the approval of the Jewish elite? The stories vary. But what we do know is that on this night his heart was hardened toward the voice of his shepherd. And he chose the heresy of choosing his will over God's. It is a gut-wrenching experience to be betrayed, especially by one you called friend. That rejection and subsequent condemnation now plays out in physical excruciating pain as Jesus is nailed to the cross. Our delusions of self-righteousness and pride are pounded into his flesh. The hurt, betrayal, selfishness and blasphemies of our guilt are as heavy as the huge nails. We can see clearly how our collective evil fixes him to the rugged cross. How we have sealed his fate with our sinfulness. He reaches out, his eyes begging us to turn to him, but he cannot embrace us. We have averted our eyes and turned away. Our sin has pinned him down and keeps him at arm's length. Later, when the nails are removed and lie rusting on the ground, the light of his divine mercy will shine through the holes in his hands. We can take solace that even with everything we have done and failed to do, in our thoughts and words, Jesus still chooses to remain in solidarity with us in his last moments, crying out, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. We killed the one who loved us most. We murdered the one who only wanted to call us to the banquet. And even so, Jesus has always been is now and forever will be on our side.
Jesus dies. Luke records in his gospel, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. Now Jesus, the most humble servant, is dead. Colours pale, and the sky darkens as the last bit of life drips from this sacrificial lamb. All Jesus has ever wanted is for us to accept his invitation to his kingdom, one ruled by unconditional, radical love. Behold the king who was even willing to die to save us. Other prophets and teachers may have shown us ways to worship or live peacefully, but Jesus, the true Messiah, with a capital M, is the only one who comes to find us in the deepest, darkest parts of ourselves. God from God, light from light. He is the begotten, true God who calls us away from a life of deceit and heartache to one of compassion and joy. He is the link between heaven and earth, the way now clearly hanging from a post like a directional sign. Satan works to blind us from this truth, but he cannot create from nothing. He can only use our weaknesses and fragile egos to turn our view from Jesus to a lesser unmarked path to nowhere. He says, look at that pitiable creature, never revealing that to give his very life for us was Jesus' plan all along. He is the horizontal beam, holding Jesus' hands to the wood, offering nothing. At the intersection of these two beams of opposing direction, we have the cross. It is finished. Scripture is fulfilled. The lamb is slain. The grain of wheat has fallen to the ground. Jesus' body and blood are offered for the life of of the world. Jesus is taken down from the cross. The use of the lamb as a symbol of God's mercy can be traced to the beginning of Jewish history. Abraham's faithfulness is rewarded with a sacrificial ram, preventing the sacrifice of Isaac, his only son. In Exodus, the Jewish people are taught how they must prepare and consume a lamb so that their firstborn sons might be passed over by the angel of death. The paschal lamb had to be a specific one set aside for sacrifice, an unblemished year-old male. At Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, we learn that he is wrapped in swaddling clothes, 
just like the lambs destined for sacrifice at Passover. The shepherds who prepared these lambs would have understood the correlation when they encountered the baby in the manger. At the Last Supper, a Passover supper during the annual week-long festival of unleavened bread, Jesus tells his disciples, Take, eat, this is my body, and this is my blood of the covenant which will be shed for many. In no uncertain terms, he was telling them that his was the body and blood to be sacrificed. He was the true Passover lamb. And they must do this, eat his body and drink his blood, to be part of the new covenant that is being established. Would they have fully understood these strange words? Perhaps those strange words took on a new significance for the women and the other disciples as Jesus' lifeless body was taken down from the cross and wrapped in linen, as he was at his birth, and laid in a tomb owned by Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph was a wealthy, devout Jew who was also a secret follower of Jesus. He was a high-ranking member of the Sanhedrin court, but was outnumbered in the decision to execute Jesus. And so he chose to risk both his life and his reputation to retrieve Jesus' body for a proper Jewish burial. He would not leave Jesus' body on the cross to be picked at by birds and gawked at by passers-by. His body would be buried according to Jewish custom, anointed with the myrrh and other spices, the women at the crucifixion had hurriedly gathered as a final act of love. Their hopes had died. Only love remained. Jesus is laid in the tomb. Once more, we are in a garden, a place where life returns to its most basic and primitive state. Jesus is buried. He is like the grain of wheat that has died and fallen to the ground. His friends and followers were taught that this must happen for new life to spring forth, and they had witnessed many miracles over the last three years illustrating this. Yet this knowledge couldn't have diminished the very human sorrow and trauma experienced by the violent murder of their beloved teacher and friend. This was new, uncharted territory. They must have been terrified that this could also happen to them, the promises of resurrection must have seemed far-fetched. Yet Jesus had raised people from the dead. And yet Lazarus and Jairus' daughter would face death again. So where is our hope? How do we believe? It is hard to come to terms with death when we have not seen beyond it. We do not fully understand this wonderful kingdom of which Jesus speaks. Later, Paul would write about the wisdom of the kingdom, referencing the prophet Isaiah. What eye has not seen, 
and ear has not heard, and what has not entered the human heart, that has God prepared for those who love him. But Paul and the apostles had received the gift of the Holy Spirit by then. Now, by the tomb in this garden, all is silent. The Spirit has not been revealed, and there is only the bleakness of desolation. Any hope of new life must be taken on faith, learned by listening to the prophets and carefully studying the life of Jesus. Take heart. Jesus will not leave us for long. He knows how hard it can be, how easily we are tempted to unbelief. When we are entombed in our own despair, Jesus Christ is not doing nothing. There is something, a prodding at the edges of our souls, an invitation to walk through the darkness with him, a call. After he was buried, Jesus descended into hell until the third day. This was not some added punishment for him. He clearly said on the cross of his human mission, it is finished. Rather, it was to gather to himself all those held in the bondage of death, awaiting his light. Jesus is willing to reach down beyond the grave to the depths of our hell to find us where we are. Be still and listen for that undercurrent of the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And know that Jesus will call us from the tomb.